got it. Okay. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Carol Teagarden, and on behalf of the Temple Sinai Women's Havara, I would like to welcome you to this presentation and introduce our guest speaker, Sister Christine Wagner. Nearly 30 years ago, Chris co-founded and opened St. Joseph's Neighborhood Center in a small abandoned building in the South Wedge to provide healthcare, counseling, adult education, and social service advocacy to the uninsured in Monroe County. As the executive director, she has tirelessly and continually re recruited the funds, the equipment, the volunteers, and the healthcare professionals to make it all happen. Today, the center has 20 full-time staff members, and you might correct me, Chris, if that's not right. No, we uh, just hired another person. So. 21. <laughs> <laughs> and more than 500 volunteers providing medical and support services to almost 3,000 uninsured and underinsured individuals annually. The center is now an educational center to more than 50 students each year who are obtaining their nursing or doctoral degree or pre and postgraduate license in mental health counseling. Through a lifetime of work, Chris has demonstrated how a successfully executed idea can elevate the standards of access to critical health and social services among those who can least afford it. In addition, she somehow found the time to earn a PhD in social science from Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. We've invited Chris here this evening to talk about the Structural Racism Initiative Program developed by St. Joseph's Neighborhood Center in 2016, which has been, and what has been learned and about the future of this invaluable program. And we'll reserve 15 minutes or so at the end of the presentation for any questions in the chat box. And if we have time afterwards, we can take some live questions. So Chris, we'll turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Carol. And um, if you just, just tuned in, you missed all of the banter as, um, Folks who are very, very good friends, we just you know saw each other and um, said hello and caught up a little bit. So it's really wonderful. And thank you for the, the invitation. Um, so Carol, you said tirelessly. Well, I'm like really tired. So it's not tirelessly anymore. <laughs> We've got a lot of stuff um, going on at the, at the Neighborhood Center. Um, our programs, um, we never we didn't close a day uh, since last March. We were able to uh, provide services um, either indirectly or um, more and more just kind of opened up. So now we're seeing people on site, um, which is which is wonderful. You can't you really can't do healthcare without having you know somebody right there in front of you at least effectively. Um, so you know we're good, um, and so you. Um, I was asked to come tonight and just talk to you about our racial equity and justice initiative, which we started back in 2016. So I, you know, I don't want to uh, take up, you know, 30 or 45 minutes by just uh, giving you, well, you know, we started this date and we did this and we did that. I want to start by start by just telling you what, well, what was the motivation for us as a healthcare center? to dive deeply into the issues of structural racism uh, and, racial, and racial equity. Um, we, over, over the years, um, have become very aware, mostly through our own patients and clients who, who come in and uh, you know, are looking, looking at ourselves, that we are just almost totally white. Um, we've had a couple of staff people over the years. Um, our volunteers are almost uh, uh, totally Caucasian. And so our, our whiteness became more and more of a, a glaring thing for us. And so just internally at our staff meetings and um, you know, just sometimes occasionally, uh, uh, casually, we would talk about well, what can we do about it? what do we do? We, we, this is the way we, we look and this isn't good. And we're not reflecting the, uh, you know, like almost 50% of the black and brown people who come in for services. 
And we very much realized that, and realized more and more that first of all, racism is a public health issue, that there are great, and probably a lot of you have seen the statistics in that, that black and brown people just have uh, worse outcomes than white people with supposedly the same standard of care, but it's not. Um, so we had to keep, we had to start asking ourselves the question, um, what do we do? Have we ever interrogated ourselves about uh, embedded structures or embedded behavior that uh, unintentionally, and I put that in quotes, um, we might be, um, we might be practicing as well. So um, it's 2016 and our social worker on staff who's been with us for almost 23 years, Mike Boucher, um, he came to me one day and he said, how about if we write a little grant to the Greater, Greater Rochester Health Foundation who had a grant process for small endeavors uh, and see if we can't get another, uh, you know, maybe one or two other agencies to go on a deep dive with us into uh, structural racism, its meaning and its effects. And I said, sure, why not? Let's see. So we, um, so we wrote the small grant and, um, and we got it. Now, did you ever have anybody ask you the question, what happens when the dog who chases the bus actually gets the bus? Uh, you know, what do I do with this now? Okay, so well, we had that. We had now this $10,000 and we had this idea. Um, and so we, you know, there were a couple Catholic family, age, Catholic family Center and there was another agency and we just said, can we just, um, you know, can we make a commitment uh, among, you know, the two or three of us to really do a, a deep interrogation of, you know, who we are as agencies and um, what are our practices. So, well, it didn't turn out that way because word got around to um, out in the city and to other social service agencies. And by the time uh, it rolled around that we were going to start, we had 28 agencies and over 200 people that had made a commitment to this. So, and we kept saying to people, you know, we really don't know what we're doing. Uh, we'll go ahead and do this, and, um, but we really don't know what we're doing. So we have to walk with each other um, in, into a very difficult subject. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so we did, we had cohort one, we had a lot of people and we designed a program uh, for two years where we had guest speaker every six months. And then the in, in the intervening months, um, it was the responsibility of every agency to form what we call a change team. And that change team needed to have on it um, whoever the, um, the leader of the agency was, whether it was a CEO or an executive director or whoever had to be part of it, as well as representatives from every level of employment. So it would be administration, middle management, um, you know, frontline workers, uh, maintenance people, um, that everyone needed to be at their table. And some of the things we asked them to deal with was the power differential that that represented on that change team um, from, uh, you know, a, a frontline worker actually being able to honestly talk and without fear of repercussion to the executive director or the CEO. Um, so, I mean, that was our plan. Uh, bring in a national speaker, do your work in between. Uh, we would send out some supports, um, e either by phone or meet with your, meet with your group. And we'll just see where we go. We did a couple of assessments. Um, one is, it's a very simple one page one. And it says, um, how to become an anti-racist organization. And there are six columns. And we asked every person in, we asked the agencies to have every person that worked at that agency rate the agency according to whether they were nowhere or a very racist organization, um, or if they were edging towards being an anti-racist organization. And we administered that 
survey, um, I think three or four times just to see if there was any movement. Um, and we also asked people to designate um, whether they were white or a person of color. So we kind of knew, you know, whose perspective are we actually seeing here? So that's just some of the mechanics of it. Um, we continued to tell everybody else that we didn't know what we were doing. And we also said very honestly at the, at the first pre-meeting, you're probably wondering why there are four white people up here um, beginning to run uh, you know, a program on, on racism. Um, and we were, you know, we were just trying to be very transparent about it. So one of the learnings that I took away from that at the very beginning was I had no idea that in the city of Rochester at that time, now this is five years ago, there would be that level of willingness to make a two-year commitment. And it was time and resources of every agency to look at the, um, at the concept and the problems of structural racism. So that was very heartening, very, very heartening. Um, and as it went on, we were nearing the end of the cohort one and wouldn't you know it, there was another uh, 20 agencies right behind that wanting to be cohort two. Um, so we said, okay, yes. Uh, now you, you have to understand that it's now 20, almost, uh, almost 50 organizations and it's over 400 people. And it was still the same three people at the neighborhood center who were running everything. Um, and we kept asking ourselves the question, but we're, uh, but we're a health agency um, and now this has pretty much taken over our lives. So we were getting into a little imbalance here just in terms of what you, you know, if you have a little mission creep, well, we had a little mission creep there. <clears throat> but also we came to realize, as I said in the beginning, that racism is a public health issue. And, you know, our total population at the Neighborhood Center is the uninsured, the underinsured, and those who are uninsurable, which would be like undocumented persons. And so as we were hearing people, as we hear people's stories every day, um, or their experiences, or their inability to access the kind of services that they need, and all of us need to thrive, it became more the whole thing of uh, you know racial disparities, especially in healthcare, became more and more real to us. So our our commitment to the racial racism um, idea just kind of deepened, and there was no way we were going to let it go. Uh, and we would just work you know work at it and work towards it. Um, it was interesting that cohort two also involved about um, 80 people from, um, I think 17 departments at the city of Rochester um, because they had engaged, they had made a commitment to, um, to racial equity as well. More ironic for me as these things just, just developed was that one of those departments of the city of Rochester was the Rochester Police Department and they also had a change team at exactly the same time that the Daniel Prude murder happened. So we haven't addressed that. It's not our place to address that with, uh, with the city of Rochester, but you can just imagine um, the irony and whatever else, whatever other word we want to put to it, that um, really this, the social unrest around racism uh, really heated up uh, in, in Rochester after Daniel Prude at the same time that the Rochester Police Department is participating in a program on racial uh, or uh, structural racism. Um, so I, I, we're not even sure yet where all the lessons are to learn, you know, to learn from that. And on top of that, um, Chief uh, Cynthia Harriet Sullivan is a board member at the Neighborhood Center. And um, she, we talked several times before she decided to take, that, uh, to take that very trying and hard role on. 
Um, so we've got we've got like fingers of connections with all of this stuff, which just raises questions um, around the whole all the issue of racial equity. I I want to. Uh, uh, one of the things I might, I, I'm, you know, will talk with you about is lessons learned, uh, either as an agency or for me personally. Um, what has what has struck me um, right from the beginning is that we it was necessary for us to focus on four levels of racism at the same time. Um, the first level would be personal. Um, what. I need to interrogate myself about what do I, how do I see myself? What are the biases that I'm operating out of that I'm not even aware of? Um, I really need to interrogate myself. Where are my ideas about racism or other people or people who are other than me? Where do they come from and what kind of impact and how do I behave? Um, because of those biases, both implicit and explicit, and we all have them. Um, you know, the prejudices and wherever they come from, we all have them. We just, and it's, it's our responsibility to know what they are um, so that we're just not blind, blindly acting and don't know what the consequences of our actions are. The second level would be interpersonal. So how is it, how do we interact or then not interact with people who are different from ourselves? Um, and, and what are the questions we need to ask ourselves? And do we even realize it? Do we realize that what we might act differently or behave differently or put ourselves in another different physical space from someone who's different than us and, and not, even, not even realize it? So the in, interpersonal, so you're going to see that we go from, this is a, a transformative process. So personal, interpersonal, and then to institutional. Um, and institutional, I'll, I'll take the neighborhood center as a, you know, as an example. Um, so we've been around like 27 years and um, never once until 2015, 2016, did we look at uh, any of the policies or practices or impact that we might have as an agency that might, might hide institutional bias or institutional behavior. We just didn't ask the question. Um, and that's that, that sometimes is the way it is with, or most times is the way it is with any institution. Um, practices, policies, procedures, uh, this is the way we've always done it, um, you know, get uh, get established, and then they generally don't get looked at. Um, and the more they hang around, the more, and then we look at them, we go, oh my God, I think this, I think this might be detrimental to the way we actually interact with, uh, you know, with some people or groups of people. And the institutional, which is basically en encased in an institution or a human service agency, or, uh, you know, a business or a bank, um, that all of those institutions together lead then to structural racism, where there is um, sometimes an implicit, but some, somehow it has gathered that, um, that the whole structure of an educational system or of a healthcare system or of a city or a state have come together with unexamined uh, unexamined rules, regulations, policies that actually exclude other people. And one of the things that I've learned is sometimes those things were purposeful. I'm sure all of you have heard about redlining and the purpose of redlining and that it was, um, you know, a, a, a participation of especially lending agencies and governments to actually say um, these are the these are we're we're going to do this and we're going to keep people of color out of this area for various reasons and those were written those were written into policy and it was collusion between uh, institutions and therefore became embedded as as uh, structural. Um, I, in fact, to hold on just a second, I. 
if I can find it here, I, just this afternoon, um, I came across, this is how I really, I'm more prepared than this. Oh, I don't have it. Um, it's examples from the 1930s, 1940s, 1960s of things that it were printed into, into the papers that actually um, codified redlining um, and just said that, you know, pers persons of color or whatever way they described uh, black and brown people um, were to be excluded from certain, uh, certain pur pur purchasing property in certain neighborhoods. That's just one example of structural racism and it's all the way through you know, our, our, um, our community. Um, so what did I learn? What did I begin to learn? So we, we started to really have some very, very candid and transparent um, conversations at the Neighborhood Center. And we have, we have some people, some very brave people on our staff who are people of color. And uh, we all left ourselves to be transparent, to have the difficult uh, conversations about race and racism. Um, and because of uh, their honesty um, about their own experiences, uh, we could we felt brave enough also to be um, honest. Uh, another thing I've learned in terms of is you've heard of safe space. Uh, creating safe space so that people don't feel threatened or whatever to um, to reveal their vulnerabilities, especially if, you know mental illness or trauma or domestic abuse. You create a safe space so people aren't threatened. The next step is is brave space, and brave space would be entering into understandings with a group of people that you are going to be brave and you are going to be transparent about what things like racism what the experience of racism is for a black person or a brown person or what the experience is for a white person coming into the realization that oh my god I may I've probably been uh, exhibiting some racist behavior my whole life and I didn't know it I didn't know it but it's that creating that brave space um, where everybody can can speak freely and you and you stay glued to your chair, you stay in the conversation when it's hard. Um, and you and we listen, we just listen to each other. Um, <clears throat> another, uh, uh, another thing that our national speaker was um, uh, Dr. Ken Harding. And uh, he used this acronym with which I share all the time. Um, and he was talking to us white people and he said, um, if you see something that appears racist or that it may be hurtful for somebody else and you don't know what to say, you wanna say something, but you don't know what to say. So the moment passes because you can't think of the perfect thing to say um, and therefore nothing gets said. He said, that I call the shame syndrome and shame stands for should have already mastered everything. Which means I'm not gonna say anything until I can say it perfectly. But the cost of us wanting to be perfect and not saying the right thing or maybe as eloquently as we would like to is that a moment uh, or a time or a conversation where, um, you know, some racist behavior is happening, it slips by and we've let it go because we wanted to say th something about it in just the right way. Um, and so we lost the opportunity to be an ally, um, you know, for whoever that uh, conversation or behavior or whatever was, uh, you know, was aimed at. So I, yeah, I'm just kind of dropping little tidbits on there because as I said, I didn't want to just say, oh, we did this and then we did this and we only did this and we did this, but we, you know, we learned along the way and we made sure that we asked ourselves, what was, what were our learnings from that experience? Um, both, both as, uh, you know, for our black colleagues and for us as, as white people, what did we learn? 
And I, I, I often am reminded of a, a book, the, a little preface to a book, and of course I can't remember the name of the book or the author, but it doesn't matter. Um, because the question in the beginning of the book is, once you wake up, can you wake up anymore? And so in this instance, we've used that a lot is because yes, if we're listening, we're paying attention and we're being honest with ourselves and with each other, we can wake up, we can wake up again, we can wake up again and wake up again. Um, sometimes I liken it to reading scripture and you can hear a story uh, or a lesson uh, you know, six times, but then you hear it the seventh time and it takes on something changes, something shifts, and it gives us a new, uh, you know, a new perspective on something we thought was old and had nothing else to give us. Um, so then I found that happening to me and to some of our agencies all the time. We were waking up uh, over and over and over again as, as things were, uh, as we realized, uh, you know, some, some truths. Um, I remember one of those waking up times for me was in one of our racial equity and, uh, and justice initiative uh, discussions. Um, and this woman of color was saying that she had taken uh, herself and her true girls um, just before, I guess just before Easter, out to Eastview Mall. Now she lives over in the 19th, 19th Ward. And they had traveled out to uh, Eastview Mall. A couple of days before that, um, uh, it happened to be that a Hispanic couple um, had been uh, stopped by the police and charged with um, shoplifting and you know that kind of stuff. So it was a, it was a nasty uh, incident. They never should have been stopped. Um, and she said we went we went into the mall, and she said I could feel it. I could feel people looking at us and people looking at my girls or people changing direction, or people moving to the other side of the mall. And the message was clear. She said, the message was clear to us. You don't belong here. What are you doing here? And she said, I had to get my girls out of there, out of there as fast as possible. Because the, um, the suspicion, the hatred, uh, you know, you are the other was palpable. And she didn't want her girls to experience that, even though they experience it all the time. So she was telling that story, and I just, I hit, it hit me in the gut, uh, you know, as a, as a white woman. Um, I am so sorry that this happened, but I also realized, and I can never experience what she has experienced. There is not any way that me as a white person can ever ever experience the 24 seven experience of a black woman or a black person. Um, and, and since then I've had, you know, good friends explain to me what their life is like. Um, always scanning a room when they walk into it to see, you know, how many people there are in there like them. Um, always looking for suspicion, always looking for the tell, the tell signs that they're not quite, not quite part of the group. And the only time they really feel safe is when they are with other people of color. And it, that just has hit me as I can, as empathetic as I can try to be, I cannot fully ever participate in what, um, in what her life uh, is like as a woman of color. Um, so yeah, I know I'm, I'm going on in these little snippets of, you know, of, of what I learned, um, at the ways that I keep waking up. Um, and I so appreciate the ways that my uh, friends or people of color will call me on, uh, you know, instances when I am uh, not being sensitive, have just not gotten it. Uh, in terms of racist behavior or um, different behavior. So I, so I have come to appreciate that. Um, and while it's still uncomfortable, um, I've just come to appreciate that and thank them for that. 
So in terms of the racial equity and justice, we start, when we first started out back in 2016, we call it the Structural Racism Initiative. Um, and that was true right through most of cohort uh, one and uh, most of cohort two. Um, and then we realized that this program had gotten, you know, much bigger. So we got a little more formalized and we actually put together a faculty who would go out and support the change teams in each one of these agencies. We had a steering committee. The steering committee came up with a charter. So this is not any different than any group that we get into that grows and then you do some formalized things, you know, around it. Um, but at that point, we also changed the name to uh, Racial Equity and Justice Initiative to uh, just demonstrate that we're looking for and building towards racial equity and racial justice um, with, you know, with our efforts. Um, you know, so we did, we did that and we, and we grew, uh, you know, in terms of our purpose. Um, and wouldn't you know, as we were ending cohort two, wasn't, wasn't there another whole 20 groups, you know, that wanted to be cohort three? Um, it, at that, at that, and then our uh, city experience with Daniel Prude happened. And our phone was ringing off the hook um, at the neighborhood center. And all kinds of people were calling us and saying, we, we need help. We need you to help us. We need an immediate response. We want to do something in our agency like right now. And um, we just reached a point where we knew we couldn't handle it. We had to go back to right sizing as a, um, as a health facility. And we didn't have the staff or the time to actually take this to the next step that it was growing to um, you know, for the city because uh, Reggie, as we called it, um, it had gotten quite a name for itself uh, and they, people knew it was quality programs. So um, at, that, at that time, um, I uh, met um, Chanel Hawkins, who was the relatively new CEO of the Urban League. And we started talking and you know, I was talking about what our situation was and she said, well, we're in a situation too. She said, actually for the Urban League, uh, racial equity and uh, racial uh, education is our mission. And she said, what we do is a kind of short-term response and interventions. She said, well, we don't have the long-term curriculum that you have developed. So in the end, what we did was transfer the whole program that we had developed over five years to the Urban League. And so they absorbed it. They absorbed the one uh, staff person that we that we had, and uh, lots of discussions and talks um, between us about the history of uh, Reggie and the purpose and what the curriculum meant and our theory of change uh, and transformation. So I would say in the history of Rochester and the uh, and merging of programs, this might have been one of the most successful. Um, they needed what we had. We needed them to um, take the program over and it, it worked. It has worked, I think, beautifully. Um, so they have absorbed it under their title of interrupt racism. Um, that was how they approached it. So um, you can go to their website, the Urban League website, and you'll see what they did. We, we let them transfer all of our website resources, which were plenty onto their website and it's called Interrupt Racism. But I have to tell you, I think the name Reggie is gonna last forever. It is not gonna go out of people's uh, you know, vernacular. So you might hear, you might hear both. Um, but we're, we're very grateful to be in, uh, you know, in union and partnership with the Urban League. And we, especially in this pandemic time, um, have uh, been able to renew our focus uh, and mission on integrated, uh, comprehensive and integrated healthcare, and that, which is really important at this COVID time um, because our, our patients need us um, and they need us, you know, focused on, uh, on what we can do for them. So um, everything has a life. And I think that's another lesson for me as you take something 
Um, it has a life. And then you just got to realize when it's time to shift. It's time to shift and change. Um, I am a sister of St. Joseph, and we have what's called a, a hundred maxims. And our maxims come from our founding in France in 1650. And the reason we had, uh, you know, hundred and some maxims is because the first sisters mostly were illiterate. And so those maxims were their lessons um, on how to, uh, how to minister, how to live in community, and all that kind of stuff. And one of the maxims is, um, oh, what's the word? Uh, it's, I, it's a, so um, do good works until near completion and then hand them off to somebody else to get the credit. So that's kind of what we, it's kind of what we think we did is we nurtured, you know, this wonderful, wonderful program and curriculum on racial equity. And then we handed it off to the most appropriate person, you know, at that time, so that we could, um, we could then refocus on our, um, our work. But our refocus has, is, it's, it's got roots in racial equity, because we have learned so much about how we need to be, what we need to pay attention to, what we can learn from our patients and clients who are, uh, you know, people of color or somehow are designated as other, you know, in our, in our community. Um, so just lots of lessons learned. Um, I cannot be more grateful for the fact that we got that little $10,000 grant, you know, five or six years ago and just, and ran with it, even though we didn't know what we were doing. And I have to admit, we still don't. Um, you know, we put one foot, one foot in front of the other, we keep learning lessons, we try to apply those lessons. But and one of the important things is we, we learn from our friends who are people of color, um, how we can be better and how we can keep moving towards being an anti racist, um, an anti racist organization. So uh, I'm going to stop talking now. And if anybody has any questions, uh, Carol said, put them in the chat, or if we don't have any chat questions, we could just, you know, open up for discussion. Because I don't know how it got to be like 20 minutes to eight already. <laughs> so one of the things we could do, because it's hard um, to raise a hand, make sure with more pages, if you want to just put in the chat that you have a question, then we can recognize you, and you can unmute yourself, and then you can ask your question. Would that be a good way to do it? Okay, so um, we have um, from Sue Stanger, uh, were any communities of faith in the cohorts? That's a good question. Um, there were a lot of the human service agencies that were aligned with uh, a community of, communities of faith, but I think in the first cohort, um, or even the second, we did not, we did not have a community that was particularly a community of faith. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And um, I think we had talked about that, but we didn't, we didn't have actually a group that, um, that uh, asked to be in the, in the cohorts. Um, I think it'd be great. I think it would be wonderful to work with communities of faith on this. Uh, and Sonia James Wilson has a question. You can unmute yourself. Hi, can, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say thank you, Christine, for your presentation and for the work that you've done in the community. And I have, um, I guess, a question and a comment. Um, the kind of work that you're describing around anti-racist education is what I do for my career. Uh -huh. So when I work with groups um, or when I finally become introduced to them, they'll often say things like, you know, we started this and we don't know what we're doing. Yeah. Which, which I find uh, kind of astonishing because people recognize that racism is a major problem, but they don't typically seek out people who have sort of taken this on as their vocation. There's this, right. sense that this is a really important thing and we don't know anything about it, but we can fix it. Yeah. Which I don't think is the reaction 
you know, if your roof is leaking or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> something else, you recognize that there's professional right. professionals. So I guess one of one of the things that I am interested in speaking to a little bit more is just about whether you recommend that approach to other groups. I recognize that there is some value in <clears throat> moving from a place of passion and diving in and learning as you go. But I think that because there are so many blind spots with racism in the United States, there's a way in which you can do a lot of harm um, yeah. in that approach. Yeah, I thank you for bringing that up, Sonia. We did actually have some expertise. Um, we, I think maybe the we don't know what we're doing is we expected, as I said in the beginning, to only do it with a, a couple of you know other agencies, and then all of a sudden it blew up into, you know, something much bigger than we had anticipated. Maybe what we didn't know how to do is to organize, you know, twenty two hundred people. Um, but th those of us who were actually forming the program and running it did did go out, uh, you know, to experts, especially Dr. Dr. Uh, Harding. Um, he's he is just absolutely wonderful, and we uh, got a lot of suggestions from him. But also, how we knew um, uh, in terms of how we were approaching change and our theory of change was that. Um, we, we were not going to be a one and done organization that we knew in our heart of hearts that this is a transformational process. And we know how to do transformation. And I also, a couple of the people we were working with are mental health counselors who also know how to face change and transformation. So we, you know, we were relying on some of our own uh, professional uh, you know, expertise. But what we really counted on and we said to all of the places, we are making this a two-year commitment because we know you can't just go to a talk and all of a sudden, you know, all about racism. That um, we need to, and when I said interrogate, I meant interrogate. And we asked people to, or, you know, the organizations to actually, with resources, to go through their personnel policies, their hiring policies, um, their financial policies um, to, uh, as I said, with, with, with direction to actually examine those in, you know, important ways. So, yeah, it's, it's a little throwaway sentence to say we really didn't know what we were doing, but we knew where we were going. And we have a, a, a pretty clear picture of what transformation is like and how long it takes. Um, and, and did actually, you know, bring in other experts. We had uh, we had a, a table of people and counselors and support people, uh, change experts that we were consulting with, and that we offered as uh, consultants to uh, all the agencies. So, point well taken, Sonia. Uh, sometimes we just felt like we were, you know, over our heads, but um, we kind of. I'll tread water together and pull together the, you know, the resources that we need. I would never say to somebody, just, you know, just jump into this. It's like somebody wanting to do mental health and they just hang out a license and, uh, and really don't know what they're doing. You can get yourselves into a lot of trouble with that. Um, so point well taken. That's not a really good throwaway phrase. Um, but yeah, I and mean, there's so many more people now um, who are helping with you know this transformation towards racial equity. So thanks for your comment. Uh, we have a question from Chris Polian. Uh, if you'd oh, like, Chris Polian, how are Pauline. you? Pauline. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sister, it's great to see your face. <laughs> Good to see you too. Oh, thanks. Um, because I'm a little OCD, I have to ask you. You said you tried to focus on four levels at the same time, but you yes. mentioned. Three. You said personal, interpersonal, institutional, and, and structural. And structural. When, the inst yeah, when the institutions all kind of come together with their own uh, 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 ways of doing things, it does become formalized structure. That was the example, I guess I didn't say that very, was the example of uh, financial institutions and uh, local governments coming together and doing redlining. Um, oh, okay. It's a structural. 
uh, right. understanding of racism. Yeah. Right. If you had no patient, this is a second question. We're, we're, we're working on this at the Zen Center, actually with Sonia's help. And she's okay, been yeah, great. terrific. Um, we have very few members of color. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how your process would have been different if you had very few patients of color. That's, yeah, that's a really, um, that's a really interesting question. Um, we would have had a whole different premise to our offering services um, because, you know, the people that we focus on are people in poverty right? Uh, or near poverty. And so I, can't, I really can't see that happening unless we were some other geographic place. Some other yeah, or some other rural, um, you know, a, 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 that would be a real challenge in a rural setting mm -hmm. um, because, yeah. you know, maybe the only exposure to uh, uh, other people of color would be migrant workers. Mm -hmm. And there is such a, uh, such a rift between understandings between, you know, maybe some rural folks and, and, and those people who are migrant workers, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, that they really don't interact, especially on any level of equality. So I think uh, I'm placing your question in a different geographic setting. Yeah, it'd be really difficult. I'd have to think about what our approach, you know, what our approach to, uh, to that would be. Mm -hmm. But it definitely would be different. It would be different. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Stephen is asking: Are there volunteer opportunities for people to participate? Uh, in our racial work or at the Neighborhood Center? I guess I'd ask Stephen to qualify. Um, would you like to unmute Stephen? Oh, he says either. Oh, either. Okay. Um, absolutely. And I guess I didn't have to qualify that because I'm going to give you this answer. We always have volunteer opportunities. When Carol said we have over 500 volunteers, um, and Carol being one of them and Chris Pauline being one of them. Um, we have both uh, professional opportunities. Uh, we have probably a hundred licensed professionals, uh, medical, dental, mental health, uh, social work who provide um, you know, our services. And then we have folks who, uh, who aren't licensed but provide all of the structure and support um, that you need to run an agency uh, the size of ours. We have between 12 and 1500 uh, enrolled patients and clients, um, you know, appointments into the thousands with all of them that, and we've got a building to maintain. We've got administrative things to do. We have people who need to greet people at the door. Um, we have a lot of technology and data analytics that we're, uh, that we're using right now. So there's really a place for everybody and we can use everybody who, who you know, who comes. Um, and why I say, uh, you know, yes, doing that would get you involved in um, our, our striving towards racial equity is that um, we have an internal program. We have an internal change team and we're devising um, programs and resources, uh, you know, and, and talks, uh, presentations, uh, challenges all the time. And it would be to all of our staff, all of our volunteers, and we're bringing in our patients and clients and asking them questions and help, helping them, asking them to help us, um, uh, you know, be better. So I would say, yes, there's volunteers there. And if you're, if you're there as a volunteer, you're gonna get enmeshed in our attempts um, to look at racial equity and justice. And how do you do that? Well, you call the center and you ask for Mary Jo Albert, who is our volunteer, volunteer coordinator. And she's wonderful, so. Um, and uh, this is from Frank, who is a volunteer. And he says, I'm somewhat of an outsider. I'm a cardiologist who is just beginning to volunteer at St. Joe's Neighborhood Center. The yep. elephant in the room seems to me to be that everyone in this Zoom meeting is white. Are we active in recruiting persons of color into the leadership structure of the center? Um, that's an, an excellent question, uh, Frank. And I'll tell you, uh, since, um, 
the middle of last year, and especially very intensely from September to October, we have uh, we embarked on what we're calling an emergent strategy process. And we emphasize the word emergent because all, all of the people, and it's becoming a wider and wider circle who are um, looking at our strategies uh, to grow and go forward into the future, are asked to stay in the moment and not to come into the strategic process with any assumptions, with any ideas about how we think the future is gonna be without um, you know, certain guesses about what uh, the pandemic is going to present to us in terms of service needs. So to really listen and look. Um, so our process had, has been to um, externally ask a lot of people uh, about um, what they think is coming down the pike, what they think the neighborhood center's place in the community is, and where they think we should go in terms of services. We also did an internal review um, and uh, you know, interviewed um, you know, patients and clients and volunteers and asked them basically the same questions. And we took, we've taken all that raw data to different, um, uh, trying to shove it down a funnel and we're getting closer to the end of the funnel so that we kind of know we're distilling that information into st some st strategic plans. But a part of this um, part of this process is knowing that at the end um, or you know towards the end, uh, very, very important discussions are going to be what leadership model, uh, and not necessarily a hierarchical one, what leadership model best fits the neighborhood center and the kind of model, uh, service delivery model that we have. When we've kind of not nailed that question down, but get, getting a bigger, uh, a better answer for ourselves is then asking what leadership qualities do we need, um, you know, for the neighborhood center. And, uh, um, and then, and then start us, well, and I, I should have prefaced this with, I, I, I tried to retire once before and it didn't work. Um, so I've insisted to the board that they got to have a process here. So they know the model and the qualities is then it's appropriate to start a, um, a process for looking at, um, a, you know, a new leader, uh, whoever that might be. It also is a part of that is we're looking at ways that we can diversify our staff, um, how we um, you know, bring people onto the board. We've made a concerted effort to diversify our board um, in many ways. Um, we are, we've um, changed or broadened our um, uh, hiring practices in that when we, we use a lot more um, avenues to uh, advertise uh, jobs and job descriptions um, so that we're getting a broader uh, a broader mix of people uh, coming in for you know for uh, staff positions so we're working we're learning to work that it's it's our fault it's been our fault if we didn't if we only had a white staff it's our fault because we didn't ask in the right places if we only had a white board, it's our fault because we didn't ask in the right places. So we've owned that and are, are working to, uh, you know, to broaden our own vision so that we have, um, we invite, we're inviting more people in. So it's a, it's a slow process, um, but it's working and uh, you, we can kind of tell the difference and we're the richer for it, so. Uh, Chris, I'd like to ask at the end of the two year period, what type of metric do you use for these organizations to go sort of do a final evaluation of what they found, what they changed? Do you get some kind of a nice package? Do they get some kind of a nice package of mm -hmm. what we found, what we worked on, what we've done, what we need to do? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's a real neat package, um, I would say it's like that, that uh, assessment of each of the agencies that we administered a couple of times, that, that's done at the, at the final, you know, and, and they get the result and they kind of do a, you know, a self-image of uh, what might have changed. 
um, a lot of the places have immediately changed some of their policies and procedures. Um, like I know Catholic Family Center totally changed the way they uh, recruit and hire. Um, just a, a total sweep of, uh, you know, out with the out with the old and, you know, in with something absolutely wonderful that they replaced it. So um, what we did along the way was have um, places where our, the agencies could talk about their, their uh, successes, their learnings, and their challenges, um, you know, going forward. Now, cohort two just wrapped up um, under the auspices of the Urban League. Um, with, and then this time we would have had all of these in person, but it was a really well uh, planned out uh, Zoom gathering of uh, lots and lots of people, all of the, the cohorts plus other people. And they were given specific times to report on their progress. And we also made it very clear that at the end of the two years, it's not over. And we are hoping that the lessons learned over two years have had them come to the realization that it was really only the beginning of their work. And, and that we had ongoing resources that they could use to continue, continue their work. So it was, was it a little wrap up? Or maybe it was a little celebration of having you know, done two years and to pat themselves on the back for the work they had done and then being sent off you know, again, to continue, to continue their work, so. Well, if there are no more questions, Chris, um, we so appreciate your spending this hour with us and, and talking about this really important program that we hope will continue um, to do the great work that you started. Um, for those of you not familiar with the center, um, I can't say enough about the services that are offered and to the people who really need them. The center continues to evolve. It certainly has tremendously in the past, I don't know, 15 years that I've been there. Um, and, and, and if anyone's looking for really meaningful work, as Chris said, there are lots and lots of different jobs that can be done. Um, it's, it's very satisfying work. Uh, it's important work and you'll meet amazing people. So, um, so, well, thank you. This has been delightful. It's been so delightful to reconnect with so many, so many friends, uh, you know, in, in your living rooms. Um, it's been good to see everybody. So thank you. I really appreciate the invitation. Thank you. And I think Joyce, did you have a question? Oh, you need to unmute. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, just to say how wonderful this was, uh, Sister Chris, and, and affirming the idea that we start with ourselves. And we have quite an extensive program of, of anti-racism uh, pro things that were people that we're bringing in. Mm -hmm. And uh, one where we start with ourselves and it's called Speaking of Race. Yeah. We'll have an opportunity, that, in fact, this very, Sunday, it's not too late to sign up from three, uh, from four, to, from four to five thirty, uh, uh, and Sandy Mitzner, I think, is on the call. And oh, great! Yeah, so uh, <laughs> that's the chance for that brave space uh, for us to to meet with one another uh, as we move forward as a congregation, as an anti-racist congregation. Well, that's wonderful. And you know, the, uh, the more people who, who join in and commit to this, the more creative ways and pathways there are to looking at the whole issue, uh, you know, and being allies and looking at ourselves and just entering that transformational space. It's really wonderful. And, and Sue Stanger just put um, a link to responding to racist remarks, which is very good in the chat. Right. Great. Thank you, Sue. Uh, okay. All right. Well, thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank All you so right. much. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you we really so much. appreciate your being here. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. This was a wonderful program tonight. Everyone. Thank you, Stacy. Wonderful.